So diversity in tech, and I think we have a great panel here that we're about to, uh, to listen to, and a great host for the day. I th um, and I want to say a little bit about them, and, and I, I asked them to come up individually. So we'll start with, with Bill uh, Pappas. And Bill Pappas is the head of operations of Bank of America's consumer, small business, and wealth management businesses, and leads the global business services, which provides technology capabilities to all Bank of America lines of business. So that you can imagine the, the, the size and the magnitude of that role. But and more importantly, as well, as he's passionate about diversity and inclusion and is a member of Bank of America's Global Diversity and Inclusion Council. So, and he's also, what we learned is he's also my tokayo, Bill. He, um, but it's actually not Bill. I'm actually not sure how to say his name in Greek, but it is, he is my tokayo. He's Guillermo as well. So please join me up on the stage. Uh, I'm the Greek version. He's the Greek version of me. Thank you. So we'll also have uh, Silvina Salazar, who's the business control strategy and support exec within the life and specialty services team. She was the Global Services LATAM uh, Chief Administration Officer based in Costa Rica, responsible for developing the growth strategy, risk management, building, and managing bank operations in Guadalajara, Mexico, and San Jose, Costa Rica. In addition, back to the theme, she's the co-executive sponsor of Ola Silicon Valley Chapter, an executive sponsor for Silicon Valley Hispanic Latino Business Council. So please join us here on stage. <laughs> and, uh, Howard Beauville is the Chief Technology Officer for Bank of America. In this role, he's responsible for the company's technology, including operations and support of applications and infrastructure. And I know firsthand, I've been, I've had a, a good uh, experience with Howard and I've known him for several years and I understand the magnitude of his job and, um, and also what, what he stands for even outside of his role. But he's also um, the, he's also the, uh, the sponsor, executive sponsor for the black professional group here at Bank of America. So very engaged with the diversity and inclusion uh, effort here. So please join us, Howard, on stage. So I think I have something in common with everyone here, especially this guy, Mario Diaz. Um, Guillermo Diaz, Mario Diaz. Um, <laughs> began his career in 19, at Bank of America in 1994. So this guy was probably five years old when he started. Uh, today he's in the Southeast Division Performance uh, uh, Division. He's a per for performance executive for consumer banking, responsible for B of A's client management strategies across Southeast network of 1,100 financial centers and more than 10,000 associates and partner specialists. He's also the national executive chair uh, for OLA, Bank of America's Diversity and Inclusion Group. So please join. So first of all, I, w I again want to say thank you um, from all of us for, the, for hosting. This is, a, this is an awesome venue, so Oracle and whoever's next, at, uh, is, we're going to have some, we're gonna have some uh, stepping up to do here. It's all around raising the game. I raising think. the game, yeah. Well, I think that's the, the theme is raising the game and what we need to do here with, include, with diversity and inclusion as well. Um, so I'll start the, the questions and um, really f maybe um, Mario and Selena starting with you. Uh, so we've, we've done some studies and the research shows that when employees are engaged and they feel that they've, they're, they have advocates, they have a greater commitment to diversity and inclusion. Even more than when there's external pressures like you need to increase your level of Latinos or black uh, uh, employees. So even with those external pressures, if they're engaged and they feel that they have advocates, they, 
that they're more in included and they feel more included. What is your perspective on, on that? Maybe start with you. Sure, I, I agree. Employee advocacy is really the driver of, of you know, building an inclusive and diverse environment. OLA is a great example of that. OLA is our, uh, stands for OLA, uh, Hispanic Organization for Leadership and Advancement. It is our employee network or employee resource group. And it really is, uh, it grew from a grassroots effort, right? For employees, by employees, who were, we were seeking to connect across uh, the company um, and, and, and were empowered by our leadership, by our company, by the structure we had. Today, OLA is, is an organization 36 chapters strong, wow. 13,000 members across the country. And it all started as a pilot in 2006 with, I think, about eight chapters we, when we started, 800 members. And through the engagement of, of every employee taking action and the leaders supporting behind it and the infrastructure that the bank built is a direct result, employee advocacy. It was not a business mandate. It was not because we were told to do it. It's because we were compelled to organize ourselves around, you know, we have five pillars, whether it's to building the workplace culture, to have community involvement, to seek professional development, to participate in the business strategy, and obviously to support external recruiting. All of that, all of us who are all our members, all our leaders, um, all our sponsors, that, that is, and, and it really truly is built from the employee, mm -hmm. by the employee, mm -hmm. and the support that we have. That is my experience of the bank. We're empowered, encouraged, and supported to doing that. So, so Marty, if they're working in that, that context is how, how does that impact their day job maybe? Is how, or how do, how do you connect the dots between their day job and the, and the diversity groups? You know, Guillermo, it's a great question. And hats off to Savina. If you think about the organization where it started from just uh, in 2006 today, to your point, 13, 14,000 members strong. And it started grassroots, right? It was a group of associates getting together and looking for ways to develop themselves, create exposure, but it's turned into something special. As to get to your question, it's always you've got your day job, but you also have your night job, right? So it's a volunteer event. It's a volunteer effort. It's a love of passion. Something magical has happened over the years. And so it is now so interconnected that, Guillermo, it's hard to separate for a lot of us. And why I say that is now it's grown into a business imperative where we've got lines of business leaders engaging with employee networks coming to us and saying, how do we partner so that we can attract the best talent? How do we expose and how do we develop and put them on a career path that we can help up and we can help pull up throughout the ranks? How do we identify key talent? That's one of them. The other piece is also from a revenue perspective, how do we help grow this business Happy to say that Ola has also been connected with a lot of key decisions and investments that we've made in the Hispanic Latino uh, segment. You think about Better Money Habits, which is a uh, financial literacy tool that we provide, all translated into Spanish. Yep. Uh, the work that we've done with mobile and online, all in Spanish as well. And so when you start looking across how Ola has taken uh, a role in that, we're also having influence on the way the business is run in order to better serve the communities in which we work and live. And can I add, yes, is that absolutely. probably not the process, but yeah. the other thing that is interesting. There's no process. Uh, excellent. We, we I like that. No, you know, I, yeah. run, <laughs> yeah. I run operations, it's everything yes. process. But, yeah. but what's interesting about this, they're describing one of the affinity groups that we have here, that right. it's all that. But when you look at the question in terms of why this is more powerful than anything externally, right. Because what those groups are doing, they're changing the system. One of the things I learned about the work that we're doing with uh, the Global Diversity Council is you can have representation, which is huge, but then you have to change the system so the system does not discriminate. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that? The way that we recruit, the way we develop, the way we are, uh, we're able to do talent planning, the way we are paying people, what those groups are doing, the voice is so strong, that we actually go back and say, does the infrastructure that is built to bring a lot of those capabilities to life and being able to run the bank, does it truly allow for that diversity to be to change? 
So I think that's the power of the all, and it's all grassroots, but it's, if you look at all of them across, it's changing the way that we actually manage the business. And right. that's There's powerful. Two, two, points, yeah. two points I could add to that as well, which is without the groups, an individual in a large organization may actually camouflage their diverse attributes, irrespective of what that diversity is, whether it's cultural, whether it's gender, whatever it may be. Um, so there's an, an empowerment when these groups come together that the individual can actually um, take pride in their cultural difference. And that's a very powerful thing for the organization because it can actually tap into that rich tapestry of different um, cultures. Um, but what it also allows to happen as well is then the more inclusive nature. Because when you do have the, the groups that are taking pride in their cultural differences and their diversity, you can better tap into, um, as, as a person that's not in that group, to be inclusive, to understand what that is. So you, you actually can tune your ear or your eyesight to actually understand what may be different in terms of the way you need to lead people from that area or how you develop people or how you pull them through or how you recruit in those different areas. So it's a very, very powerful thing for the employees from an employee engagement piece to your yeah. point. But to Mario's point, it's also incredibly powerful in terms of how we serve our customers, because right. we serve a very diverse um, range of communities, um, and, and that's a massive resource that we can tap into. Yeah, well, and, and to the point earlier is, you were exec sponsor for the, the, the Black uh, Professionals Group, right? Mm -hmm. So you're seeing it across, and then Correct. you're seeing it even broadly um, across all, about of, yes. all, the all different, the affinity, or, groups, all the affinity yeah. groups. And I just saw, I, we're gonna, by the way, this is we're probably going to go all over the okay. place, so forget about these p pieces of paper. We can handle um, that. But I saw even today um, that it, the CNN published something, or actually uh, last week, but I just saw it today, was that the, the Hispanic woman will be the, mo the, the that's where the power is going to come from. Yep. However, that the... Mm -hmm that if you look at the parity of pay, it's for every male, executive male, uh, oh, that gains a dollar, the Hispanic woman is 63 cents. Yep. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an oppor a big opportunity there to then actually maybe yep. leverage this, the power of what Absolutely. we're talking about. And that's and what that I'm cross about, changing, stitch the, changing the system. Right. It's not only talking about the numbers, it's changing the system. Is that they pay, the way we pay people. Right. How do we change that and how do you make sure that you understand those dis disparities? And by the way, I always thought that the Hispanic women had the power. Me too. Yeah. I'm just saying, me too. Just, everybody I walk, that, that's not news to me. I say that every day I'm when not, I go I'm just home. Saying. Yeah. <laughs> but, but on, but on the, the, the pay disparity, it's, it's also down to the institutions. And, and Bank of America has a very proud record in terms of right. really driving uh, pay equity based upon the role. <clears throat> not on the diverse group or actually on the gender. Um, and there's huge progress that, that we've made almost to the point, actually, I think we're at um, peer parity for uh, females based upon the actual function that they're doing. We're now taking it to the next level, which is okay, to say, okay, are these, these roles that would you deem to be power alley roles being occupied by females as well? So we're, we're factor, factoring that into our, um, our talent profile. External to this, however, if it, it may be related to the stat that you have from CNN. If you look at... Um, the, the Latinx community, it's a very entrepreneurial community in terms of creating uh, businesses and therefore creating wealth in the communities. And then another metric within that is actually it's very often driven by females, um, a huge female entrepreneurial um, quality there, so really mm -hmm. driving the U.S. economy. I think 50% of yeah. the new small right. businesses are led by female right. Latinas. That's true. And let me throw another one at you so then we can just kind of dig into that, is... 60% of the U.S. Hispanic population is under the age of 34, mm -hmm. meaning that there'll be pace setting for tech adoption for years to come. And yeah. it's probably going to yeah. even, you know, so back to your question, your point about the system needs to yes. shift. Yes. It, you know, the, you know, these are the millennials, the, the, the shift in mindset, the, the born in, in, in the cloud and, and born with digital tools in their hands yep. is, that's, you know, the system needs to start to shift, yeah. right? And, and, and the way I look at this, you're absolutely right. It has to change. First of all, we need to make sure 
that our organizations reflect the communities that we're doing business with, which means when you look at that type of demographic, we are far from this. That's what I call the numbers. So this is the representation. And there's more work to be done when you look at all of this. We, there is not enough that, that we will be able to bring in with that type of uh, with STEM uh, capability. So we need to do a lot more work to make sure that we bring them in. The second thing is what you just said. As you bring them in, how do you retain? One of the things that we have found, even within the Bank of America, we do a really good job of yeah. creating the early pipeline, but we're losing we that, as yeah. we're moving. So how do you retain them and making sure that the system changes enough so not only how you recruit them early, but how do you develop, how do you pay, how do you coach? That system needs to change in order to be able to ensure that you retain that population. And then is think about the ability to ensure that that population, if you have them, they need to be able to help us to develop product and services that really it makes sense for them. Because right now, the way we have it, if you don't have the, the, right, the right population, whatever we develop, whatever we're going to come up from service or processes, they're not going to reflect that uh, specific uh, part of, the, uh, of, uh, of our uh, culture. And then, uh, how do you make sure that uh, you're able to retain it going forward? So you need to, we need to ensure that we grow it, the talent, you change the system to be able to be with us, and they will be able to reflect a lot of this into the services and the products that we're developing across. Good. How about, Sylvia, any, any additional comments? How do we harness the, the power of that, of, of looking at the demographic of that, that young spirit coming into the organization? I, well, I, I think Bill covered, you know, in general, how we, from a bank perspective, what we need to change. I think it's important to, you know, if you start early influencing you know, how do you engage in the community and forums, or how do we go out and, and present what we are as an opportunity, right? Participating, creating the awareness about career opportunities, technology careers, or others that we can just, you know, invite them to join and create an environment that evolves with them and creates that challenge. So that every three to five years, they're looking for the, you know, what's a new thing, and how do we stay relevant to creating that, that work environment? Um, you know, we have five generations today at work at the same time in our corporation, right? And it's, it's, it's interesting, how do you engage and communicate, motivate, inspire, um, and, and, and organize all, all yourself across, the, across all of them? Yeah. And you need them all. Reality is we need them all. And we all need to learn from each other. So it's, it's, it's in the making, right? That's, that's what we're all you know, kind of managing to work through. So maybe Howard and Mario, is there, are there consequences for not bringing more Latinx or Hispanics into the organization, or what? What do you, what do you think about? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think there's just an unstoppable force, a demographic force for Latinx to get a much deeper uh, penetration, not just into technology, but into all industries. Um, the um, our responsibility as the current leaders, um, and, and in some cases the pathfinders for, for folks, is to ensure that we are advocating and sponsoring for diverse mm -hmm. groups coming through. There's a lot of talk around education and how that's important and how people need to understand how they circumnavigate the educational system if the US, if they come from a different country. But I think equally as important to the educational um, system is just making people aware of the possibilities that exist. Um, the, um, it's, it's understanding that uh, where they start in life doesn't necessarily mean where they'll finish. Your own personal experience, G, in terms of what we were discussing last night is a great example of that. Yeah. Um, and you just need people to actually give you those opportunities to understand from a conversation what that is. Um, the, the other point I'd kind of make as well around the, uh, the Latinx millennial um, population coming through um, and the diversity of thought and the, and the value that they can add to the company they come to is sometimes just not the educational piece. It's the fact that they are actually uh, have more than one language. Yes. Um, and there's many studies in terms of if you have more than one language, you think in a different way. Not yeah. just from the cultural heritage that you have, yeah. but the fact that you're using semantic analysis in your brain in a different in way. And that's tremendously um, helpful in terms of problem solving from a different perspective and a different aperture. Yeah. So there's other 
skill sets that you may have that may not be classically trained, educated, that you went to Berkeley University or you went to um, Stanford. I can't pronounce some of these. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, from, I'm, I'm from the north of England, so English is my second language. The, um, yeah. the, um, the, uh, but but there's, there's other qualities that we equally should be looking for as opposed to the classic colleges and schools that people go to to pull through, and therefore it's becoming more in tune with looking for those qualities as we, uh, we recruit. Yeah, so just to piggyback off of that, I mean, I'll give you a little bit more ammunition. So for us, we're looking at about 9.5 million of our clients are consumer Hispanic Latinos. Uh, the majority of those, uh, median age, uh, about 29 years old, to give you an idea. And so if you think about what we do for our clients, we want to give them the power to achieve certain things throughout life, right? We want to be there for their clients, for our clients' life stages and make sure that life priorities are addressed throughout their, their, uh, their lives. Well, if you're younger, obviously you're going to have a lot more life stages along the way. And so that gives us the opportunity to really connect and really think through at a pivotal moment in our clients' lives, are we there for them? Can we communicate with them? Do we have the associate base that is able to communicate? But to your point, not necessarily just in language, but is also bilingual, bicultural, and has an association to being as much American as to whatever country they may have come from. And so for us, we're really looking at how are we, where are we recruiting? Are we connecting with college campuses? The time that we're spending with our nonprofit organizations and not just looking for talent, but preparing talent to enter into the workforce to set them up for success. And then along the way, keeping very engaged with that talent throughout their career. As a matter of fact, for the first time, what we're doing is we're actually client-facing associates. We are now training them in language. So imagine you're hiring, you're certifying, and you're training in language your associates to be able to communicate effectively in their local communities. We haven't had that before. Uh, you think about the work that we're doing around providing tools and resources for clients, all of it in language. And so there's a lot of energy trying to tap into the talent, preparing them for success and then making sure that we have that continuous um, opportunity to promote into leadership ranks as well. But the risk is it's an extremely competitive labor market, yeah. and we risk uh, alienating a client segment, which is significant. And by the way, our client segment, I mentioned about 9.5, that's about 15% of our clients, which accounted for 34% over the last 12 months of our acquisition. So if you think about our growth in the consumer channel, 34% came from the Hispanic population. Oh. That's why. Yep. The, the, the other thing that is interesting, and even bring that back to technology, I know that was one of the segments you guys were talking a lot around AI. One of the things that we're just talking about AI is just the responsible use of AI and the biases that goes into this. Think about if we don't have the diversity that we need in our workforce. That means a lot of people coding, there is white, older American male. That they think about that, even fundamentally as that. So when people start talking about now the power of AI and who is building that algorithm and where is all the biases that are going into that, and do you have enough diversity into that to make sure that you're able to really represent? The other question that somebody asked me is like, why all the AI models have a female name? Think about that. Think, but I never thought about it, but it's think about what is the type of diversity that we kind of require, especially with the power of technology and what we're about to do, mm -hmm. and how much do we need that type of millennials to coming in with that diversity of thought, that diversity of background, the diversity of language to ensure that what we do, it has a full representation of the communities that we're serving. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. Uh, just a little funny story is like we have this, uh, uh, you know, Alexa yeah. in our house. So we have some, some blinds and things that are powered by Alexa, but for when my wife does it, they don't, they don't work. Uh, <laughs> because I'm like, well, when you call her Alisa, exactly. it doesn't work. Uh, has... I get it. My worst nightmare always has been when I have to call somebody and it's like, speak, I say, say one or two, I can never get it. Yeah. It was because my accent so, doesn't work. It, you know, it's kind of a joke, but it's, it's a little true. bit, it's, there's, there's It's absolutely true, because that. somebody so, developed it in that there is zero accent. Yeah. And that's not the case. That's, yeah. It's true. All right, so, so we've gone like a little bit way off script. So I want to go uh, just quickly, fairly 
just a tad bit deeper. One of the things that I said this morning in the women's breakfast, I was asked, what was that one word that, that you kind of connect with? And I said, ejemplo. Ejemplo is example. Can you think of the, if you think about diversity in tech, I mean, each of you have a story. What is that story that you can share that is an example of maybe a challenge or an, how you turn that into an opportunity in your role in technology as leaders? And what, how, do, how would you maybe inspire this, or this team? I mean, for me, and I think uh, a lot of you were here in the morning when my boss was here, but part of this, we look at the technology, your ability to be able to connect very, versus divide. So this whole idea that everything that we do in the processes, where that can you use technology to be able to unite and being able to just have that common, uh, common thing. So I look at technology as a new way to figure out with all the difference and everything that we have seen, how do, how do you see this to empower people regardless of all the differences that we have? So technology can rise a lot more than, than, than we have seen. And, and you believe that's something that you've sort of taken on and, and have been a, an example of in your I organization? Uh, yes. I guess um, two aspects. When you think about, from a technology perspective, I'm, I'm, I manage risk. I mean, that's what I do today, and it's all about understanding the risk and the process and the controls you need to have. And back to the comments that earlier Kathy made about equality, innovation, innovation. You know, when you think of robotics or AI, you know, the path that we're or how, where, and can we automate controls or just prevent the defects so we can remove, if you will, the human intervention to ensure that the risk is mitigated not to take the human out of the process, to enable the ability and, and have those, spend the time in innovating and being thought, and, and really being more of a thought, you know, leadership, if you will. So that technology, it, it, the challenge is, how, how do you get into doing that? We have, you know, we have a lot of initiatives underway, but it's not easy to do that. However, it is our vision, it is our, it is our, our charge, if you will, from where we want to be from a controls perspective. Um, I think challenges from a career perspective, you know, you, you can always think about when you walk into maybe, you make that decision, right? You're gonna go into an environment where you've never been, you don't have the experience, but you have that core belief that you have the capability of learning and, and able to overcome any obstacle. You know, I, I, through my career, have taken, made decisions of going across a very broad spectrum of roles and areas with a full understanding that I did not know, but I did know that I could learn and do it. So I am an example from that view. I, I, I communicate that not knowing is just the beginning of what you're going to do. That's good. Howard. The, um, I guess the key thing that I've kind of learned as I've gone through uh, my career and kind of personal life is kind of what you are today is and what you're going to be tomorrow unless you actually decide that that's the case. You can elect to be kind of set in stone and then stay in the place that you're in, or you can elect to be a, a lifelong learner, and that doesn't mean necessarily having a book in your hand to learn, but that, that does help. Um, but actually just learning from the experiences that you go through. And do that armed with a, a number of other qualities, which is everybody belongs. Uh, we are one species, which is the human race. Um, it's just that some of us have got different colored skin, we love different types of people, or whatever it may be. Um, but if any of us wanted an organ transplant, we'd quite happily take it from a different, um, different uh, affinity group. Um, so everyone belongs, and therefore, as a consequence of that, if you feel like you belong, you'll contribute. Um, and if you're contributing, you're making a difference to the quality of the decisions that are being made. Um, so it's just having the attitude that keep on moving forward, keep on changing. Um, you don't get to live once, you get to live every day. You get to die once, um, and make sure that the passage in between is something that's been fulfilling for you. Well oh. Not sure I could follow that. Yeah, no. I was like, drop the mic. Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Uh, you know, for me, uh, you mentioned it's uh, 25 years here with the organization, uh, literally right out of high school. Uh, first generation born in this country. My parents were uh, political refugees from Cuba. And when I started working here, paying my way through college, uh, university down in Miami, but I had no idea that I would ever continue a career with Bank of America. I've moved all around different lines of businesses, different uh, parts of the country. 
Uh, and it's been an absolute blast. It's been a lot of fun. There have been some trips and falls along the way, but would never have dreamt that I've been here because I'd never seen anyone else or I'd never been around anybody in my community or my family that had seen that. So I hadn't seen that before. So it wasn't he until I got here that others took the time to show me that what was possible. And if I put myself and put the work into Howard's point and had showed contributions, what that means out the other end. And so for me, it's important that I could do that for others as well. And so the amount of opportunity is absolutely amazing. And so some of the work that we're doing through Ola is making that connection through mentorship, uh, sponsorship. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're working with Bill's team right now to introduce Ola members into technology opportunities, into different types of roles that traditionally uh, we, they, we haven't gone into before. So uh, that's, that's some of the work that, that we're doing today to make that difference. But one thing that is interesting across is the continuous learning yes. mm. culture. Yeah. And I think part of this is a lot of us, we have so many different roles, but the, the only thing is your ability to create the culture that helps to learn and continuous learn and be okay in a safe environment to fail early enough to be able to just bring all of these things together yeah. as you grow into the organization. Yeah. We have... Uh one of the most powerful teams on the planet. So I'm sure that you guys have questions here. Of um, any any questions from the audience? I knew that was going to happen. Hello, my name is John Canella. I'm a security analyst at FireEye. So. Diversity in tech is extremely important. As someone who's Dominican, I know like, seeing people that look like me in the workplace makes me feel like I want to go to work and be with people who are like me. It makes me feel happy. Yeah. Um, I guess a question that I have in regards to diversity, it seems like as I learn more about diversity in tech and people at the top talking about diversity, it's like the culture, like people understand that it's important um, and I guess that, like, there's like this expectation that if people at the top understand that diversity is important, it's going to trickle down to people in the mid-level and people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Do you think that you could trickle down culture for diversity, or is that is that something like within a huge organization, people at the top can understand the importance of diversity, but how do you address subcultures within a huge organization that don't understand the value that yeah. diversity provides? I can start. I think you need to do both, but don't underestimate an organization as big as our size. Top down, it works. So it's interesting because uh, today there was a, a lot of a lot of these bank CEOs was testifying back in Capitol Hill, and they got a lot of questions around diversity and inclusion. And what they wanted to know, they wanted to know if across the board, how do we manage that? And one of the things that definitely differentiated us. Our CEO, he's, he's chairing our GDIC, which is the Global, uh, the global Diversity, <laughs> and inclusion. Diversity and Inclusion Council himself. So he has not missed one meeting, and we meet every month. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Think about the, how does that translate to everybody else? Because if the CEO thinks it's important enough to spend a whole day out of the month to really come together and talk about that, that sends a message. The other thing is at the same time is what we have the affinity group. So we have the bottoms up as well. So you have the top down, you have the bottoms up to make sure that uh, and somewhere in the middle, all of this comes together. And I think there is two ways that you kind of look at this. Why this is important? Because A, you need the representation. You need to make sure that we have the numbers and it, we look and uh, act as the same as the communities that we serve. But then, why it's important to have the top down? Because the system needs to change. Bottoms up, you can rally, you can have the community, you can have the understanding, you can do all of this, but then you need the top down to be able to start changing the system, to start changing the way you recruit, to start changing the way you develop, to start changing the way that you actually can accompany people, to really build the infrastructure so those all affinity groups are able to thrive. 
So I just don't think it's one or the other, but I cannot underestimate the power of the top down yeah, for an organization like this, it sets the tone. And a lot of people have always told me like, look, to your point that you make, I'm always looking at who is sitting at your leadership team. If I don't see anybody that looks like me, it's very hard for me to imagine how can I get there. So it does matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody else? No, I think that does it. Other. Can you use that with that mic? Yeah. Uh, I am Edwin Rodriguez from Microsoft, and I have a question regarding the cost of not succeeding. So if we're saying that there is a risk involved, have you been able to develop the model that shows statistically what is the cost of failure? And with that, have you been able to discuss that internally given your different areas of uh, businesses? And, and then is there urgency from the top to address then the risk? Uh, uh and this is, uh, you guys, the, um, I'll, I'll think, tell you, but I'm going to let you jump in, I guess. The, um, I mean, some, thing, some things, the values are so evidently identifiable that you don't have to do the ROIs around the cost. Um, the, with no disrespect to the Microsoft the productivity suite, Excel spreadsheets don't refuse keystrokes, so you can put any old rubbish into there to do an ROI on, on the cost um, around this. It's, it's just... It's, clearly the right thing to be doing in terms of getting diversity of thought, diversity of opinion. Uh, demographically, it's obviously the right thing to be doing. All of the points that Mario is right. far better situated than I am to talk <laughs> yeah. about in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the business side. Um, uh, yeah, so you think about, so a couple of things. If you want to look at it from a cost perspective, we know what it is to acquire talent. So client-facing roles uh, you know, can range anywhere from five to you know fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just to attract, right? That's to get somebody in and get them onboarded. That's not to mention to onboard them and train them for a good year. And typically, uh, the, you don't reach full uh, proficiency in certain types of roles for either six to twelve months. So now you're looking at what it costs to train that individual. We do know that employee networks have a much higher retention rate. We have a higher associate satisfaction rate, by usually about three and a half to four points higher in overall employee engagement and satisfaction. So retention is better, engagement overall is better from associate perspective. And then another important thing that we probably don't measure well enough is what employee networks do well, the, the associates who are engaged, they recruit for you. They find additional talent and they bring them to the organization but, as well. And can I say one more thing? What's interesting, the first thing that our CEO said is we're going to stop that. We're going to start debating the money. Mm -hmm. We're going to start debating any. So as soon as we stop justifying why diversity is profitable for us, we start making progress. Awesome. And the whole thing was very simple. Look at the, we started even gender. If 50% of our population is females and you're sitting within organization and that's not the case, that's not right. So we completely had moved. None of, I've been on the GDIC for a year. We have not spent nanosecond talking about why DNI or diversity, it's really profitable. We stopped doing any of this. So my advice to a lot of you that you're sitting there still trying to justify. You had analysis by paral paralysis we, by analysis. Maybe. Let's start that it's not right because our clients and the communities that we serve does not reflect the way that we are today. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that. Regardless, this is not money. This is we need to ensure it's the right thing. it is the right thing to do. So one of the things that he said, start, as he started, said, we are not doing any business cases. Stop the madness. Stop the madness now to justify why our population needs to be, reflect the communities that we are doing business with. Makes no sense. So I won't even spend any time just doing that because it's the right thing to do. One, one last question, I think, up there. Hello, everyone. My name is Warren Gonsalves from Cisco, and uh, this has been a great conversation, so thank you. So my question is around... Pay, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, G. Um, so one of the things that I find is that, you know, one thing is about bringing in the talent that's diverse, right? 
But how about retention? Is that also some something that's being thought about as we try to diversify tech? You said retention? Retention. 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 Yeah. Uh, for me... You kind of hit on it earlier. Yeah, earlier. and for me, because we, we got as an organization, we got a lot better around the numbers. We got better understanding the numbers that we need to get, and we got better being able to attract. Inclusion is the second piece that is always harder to be able to put your arms around because that's what causes your retention. So right. what does inclusion really mean? And you mentioned it is as soon as you feel included and you will be able to feel that you can add value. So we're spending a lot of time figuring out the inclusion piece and the, how do you actually change the system. So not only you can say, okay, I'm here now, but do I really belong here? Do I feel that I belong here? Do the systems that we have in place and the infrastructure does not discriminate me just because I'm here? And that's the inclusion piece. So we're doing a lot more work and I think it's a lot harder that piece to be able to just retain because it takes a lot more than that. So we have seen we got a lot better being able to bring the right pipeline with the right representation and we're spending significant amount of time to really make sure we're framing that inclusion piece, ensuring that our system actually supports that inclusive uh, culture that we have developed and making sure that whatever you looked at it, you can see yourself to be in a lot of different teams. But inclusion is huge because we learned that we can bring folks in by the left because they, being here, it's only the beginning, but if they don't feel that they belong, they won't contribute and they won't definitely stay here for very long. And I just would like to add, um, it all starts at the top. And I wanna share with you something. I personally attended a, a breakfast where Brian Moynihan um, was, was talking to us. We were a group of diversity leaders and he literally said that he was uh, building a company where people didn't have to check out at the door who they were in order to be successful. We are all here encouraged to bring our whole self to work. And it is about feeling that you belong. Employee networks create that environment. I can tell you that the, the reason why we have 11 employee networks, more than 200,000 members, and 280 chapters across the world, is because each of us have found an affinity to join, whether it's LGBT, lead, you know, lead for women, um, military, uh, parenting, young <clears throat> professionals network, Asian, black, what, we have an affinity. And actually some of us are part of many. I mean, I'm part of three different employee networks. And that keeps me be connected and feel that I belong. Um, all, we all have a day job, but the roles that I have held from a diversity perspective, it was giving me the opportunity to be in this panel today and connect with leaders like I have. So the value proposition is there. Yeah. Well, um, so I think I'm, uh, we have to cut off the, the talk right there. But what I would say is that I'm, um, I actually feel very proud to be sitting here with you all. Um, I feel proud because you're the examples of how you, I mean, I understand, um, and I, I think you even take it up a notch, the magnitude of your day jobs. I understand what it is like to have that second job of trying to actually stitch across and raise the, the, the visibility of inclusion and diversity and across whether it's the Hispanic group, the black group, the the multiple 11 um, inclusion and diversity groups. And then, I, and then when, as I talked to you individually, I learned one more thing was that there was, always a, there was always another purpose, a purpose that is even more personal and deep. And when you can do your role and do that good for the organization, but also do good for the broader community, uh, I just wanna say I'm very proud to be sitting here with you and Thank you for hosting us. Thank you for being with us today. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.